Hello St John's, it's great to be with you again. Uh, if this is your first time with us here at St John's online, my name is Pete Wood, I am the Assistant Minister, and we are in the book of Acts. We're looking at Acts 17 again this week, and I wonder how your week has been. Has it been a good week or a bad week? Do you feel like you've made lots of progress, or has it been a bit like this? Have you felt like it's one step forward and two steps back? Well, that's the situation that we find the Apostle Paul in, as we go to the book of Acts uh, and go from verse 16 in chapter 17. And we find Paul literally sort of running from his life, if you will, or being encouraged to run from his life. You see, he's in a place called Thessalonica at the beginning of Acts 17. There are some people there, some Jewish people there, and they get jealous and don't like him, and his friends are beaten up. He's asked to uh, leave town for his own safety. So he goes up the road to Berea, which is 75 kilometres away, and again, these Jews from Thessalonica, they find out where he is uh, in verses 13 to 14 of Acts 17. Uh, and they come, stir up a crowd, and he's forced to run again. And the, it tells us the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast. And that means, of course, going to Athens. Now, this is not Paul's choice of destination. He doesn't choose to be there. I mean, Athens is a cool place. There's lots of good things to see. But that's primarily not why he is there. He's there to try and get away from the danger that he is in from people who, well, want to either have him arrested or his life ended. I wonder, though, if you have ever been somewhere that just felt totally weird, like uncomfortable, alien, if you will. That's the situation that Paul finds himself in. And I guess for me, I felt a bit like that as I went to Bali a couple of years ago. We stayed in a very nice resort, but we walked around lots of places, a local village. We went to see some Balinese cultural things and everything about the place just stood at odds to kind of the way that I think about the world. Uh, even their architecture seemed weird to me. There was um, shrines literally everywhere. The architecture, the practices, the language, everything at some level is informed by their religion. Uh, and this is as against Australian society where a lot of things are just secular and you know, we're not encouraged to necessarily talk about God. Well, this is the situation that Paul finds himself in Athens as he comes to terms with ideas and idols. And the verse, first verse that we look at in Acts 17 today, uh, verse 16, tells us this. While Paul was waiting for them, that's his friends in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So Greece uh, at that time, uh, not the empire that it had been. Athens was a sort of fading city, if you will. Uh, Corinth turned out to be a much more influential place in the first century, but still it's full of the then Greek culture, which is a pantheon of gods and a big interest in philosophy. And we're told that people in Athens at that time, later in the passage that we're told that they just sat around talking about ideas all the time, but they're all obviously also committed to worshipping idols and going to temples and things like this. And Paul's really, he's upset by that. He finds it disturbing and upsetting. And I reckon it's a similar thing for us. We, we should be alarmed when we see religious idols. A few years ago, I saw uh, statues like the, the picture you've got here of Buddha uh, for sale in Bunnings, and it worried me greatly. People are enslaved to, uh, to pagan idols, just the same way that they're enslaved to things like greed or, um, or fame or family or their career or whatever else. And James encouraged us to, uh, yeah, to seek out the things that are our idols and to try and put them aside. Secondly, I guess in terms of thinking about ideas in the Greek context, Paul seeks to speak into the way that they think about the world to bring Christianity, because Christianity is reason. It's based on logic. And to be ready to give a testimony about that. Now, we talked about this passage last week. Uh, 1 Peter 3, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And obviously... Paul is seeking to do that in the place that he is. Now, in Australia, we, uh, we're not Greek, uh, we're not Jewish either, but we have our own ways of looking at the world. We have ideas 
uh, we have idols as well. And I wanted to sort of think about what some of those ideas are. One of them that, that sort of struck me, I guess, in middle class society is the idea that, you know, at a dinner, a dinner party, that it's kind of off colour to discuss sex or politics or religion. And the other one that I think that has come up more recently is the idea that you can't question other people's beliefs, that it's, you know, that it's offensive or upsetting to question what other people believe. But I want to tell you that Western society quite generally is built on a foundation of questioning everything. So we ought to put that to one side. Again, we want to, we want to respectfully and gently question the things that, people, other, that other people think, but even still, we should be doing that. And in terms of uh, sex, politics and religion, well, let me just say about politics and religion, from people that I've met from other cultures are happy to talk about politics and religion. It's just Australians who find it uncomfortable. In fact, they like to talk about it. I've been to a couple of meals from people, with people from other cultures who I've asked about their religion and they were happy to tell me and then asked me questions about mine. And the interchange was a good thing. And I suspect Paul might be experiencing something like that as he is in Athens then. So we're told in verses 17 and 18 that he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, that is, Greek people who think that Judaism is a good thing, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Now you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? What's an Epicurean? What's a Stoic? Well, let me show you some things. You might find that there's some ideas in here that aren't a great deal different than our society today. Epicurean people were, I guess, uh, students of the, uh, of the philosopher Epicurus. And Epicureanism is about being devoted to sensual enjoyment. I mean, particularly, I guess, food and drink. Uh, but these people, I guess, if we wanted to define them these days, were about avoiding pain. They were, uh, they were sort of atheistic in a way that they didn't believe in religious superstitions and things like that. But they were also very much materialists in that they believed that there wasn't anything outside the material realm that we live in. And they were about enjoying life as it was during that time. So it's the whole, you know, you only live once or fear of missing out type thing that's driving their philosophy. Then, of course, we have the, uh, the Stoics. Um, these people were people who wanted to be able to endure pain or hardship without showing feelings or complaining. And uh, the, the way that I've heard this explained is that uh, a Stoic ought to be able to react to the death of a child in the same way as they react to a good meal. Now, that's a bit, a bit strong for me, but I found this quote, and this is what it says. The wise man should be free from passion, unmoved by joy or grief, and submissive to natural law. Well, Interesting thing. Stoicism, you might be interested to know, has had a bit of a resurgence at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, and people are interested in what it is to be a Stoic again uh, and rejecting, I guess, materialism. Stoics and, and uh, Epicureans were sort of at, at odds with each other, so it's interesting in that discussion there. But I guess, how do we, how do we react in our society to people who might be hedonistic, they might be sort of living a YOLO lifestyle, they might be stoic. Well, the thing that, the, that Paul, I think, does in this situation, and the thing that, for instance, Sam Chan encourages us to do in his book on talking to people about Jesus, is to listen. To really listen, to ask people about their life, their story, um, the way that they feel about God, or who that they think God is, and to really let them talk. Uh, and he has this trick where he says you take a sip of water when somebody stops talking so that they feel they have to just keep talking and they tell you everything they think. And really that you're in the business of getting to know them first. And apparently that's what Paul does very successfully because he's then invited to, uh, to go and speak to the Areopagus, the, uh, the Council of Greek Philosophers, as it were. Now... Uh, I think it would be fair to say, knowing that Paul was uh, an educated uh, Jewish man, but also grew up in, a, a, in a, a Greekish city, that he would have understand what it was to 
deliver a speech, to, to be an orator, as it were. So I'm going to take a little bit of, uh, a little bit of um, poetic license, you might say, uh, because I think there's a good chance that Paul might have followed the, for instance, uh, not-so-secret formula for persuasive talks. That is what he's about. So I've got my toga. Here we go, no fear. I'm going to leave, leave my other clothes on. And uh, I'm going to see if I can perform Paul's talk in the way that he might have performed it at the Areopagus in the first century, because these are the sorts of things that they did. So let's have a crack at this. First of all, I need to assume the pose. Here we go. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed time in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, this is the end of Paul's speech, and I think that he gets cut off when he starts to talk about the resurrection, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about what's happening in this speech. Paul starts off by saying, well, you guys are spiritual, but you're ignorant about some of your spiritualism. And so he starts with a compliment, but also a gentle challenge. Then he says to them, God made everything. And by doing this, what he's seeking to do is to have them understand that the world isn't the pagan chaos that the Greek pantheon of gods has taught them. He said it's an ordered place that God has done it, that he's a good God. He then says next that we are God's offspring. Uh, and that has a couple of elements going on with it. First of all, he's saying that we are like God. And because we are like God, gods are not idols. And so it's inappropriate to, to worship idols. And he uh, even quotes their own poetry as a part of that. So it's a clever thing to do. Shows that he's educated in Greek matters. Next up, and lastly, he says, God is patient, but his judge is here. And the resurrection... Of Jesus is the proof of that. Now this is all very interesting but actually what I wanted to do was to sort of do a quick survey of the things that Paul doesn't mention. So Paul firstly doesn't mention Israel or the prophets. Now they probably would have known that he was an Israelite. He secondly doesn't mention the scriptures at all which again is a curious thing because we know that Paul talks about the history of Israel and the scriptures in lots of places. Really interestingly, he does not talk about Jesus at all. Now, that's one thing that sort of blew me away. And he also doesn't talk about the cross or atonement or, for that matter, forgiveness. He certainly doesn't mention baptism and he doesn't mention the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's a bit confounding, isn't it? It's a bit unusual for us to think about it. But then if we go to Acts 16, we look at the words that he uses when he speaks to the jailer who says, how must I be saved? We maybe get a bit of an insight as to what's happening here. Paul said to the jailer, believe in Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his household. Now, we don't know all the other things that Paul said, 
But I think the thing that's clear here is, in terms of talking to people about Jesus, every different context needs different words. The, the, same ex, you know, the same explanation of things isn't going to work with everyone from the same world or even every person from the same country. Now, uh, for people who are sitting there thinking, well, hang on, this is a bit of a worry because what am I going to do when I need to talk to my friends about, about Jesus, especially if they're from all over the world, like so many people in Sydney are? How will I know what to say? And I wanted to, to give you a little bit of hope as far as this goes. First of all, I want to take you to Luke chapter 21, verses 12 to 15, where Jesus is talking to his disciples about the end times, about after his resurrection and before he returns. And he says this, he says, They will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. Is that, that is the, the life of a Christian, isn't it? To bear testimony to Jesus. And in verse 14 he goes on, he says, But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you'll defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. So I want to start by saying, don't worry about it. Pray about it. Pray for opportunities to, to talk to people about Jesus, but also pray that God would give you the right words to say. And in many situations, I, I've experienced that he has. The next thing that I wanted to do, though, was to give you some five-word phrases that you could use as you're speaking to people and they're asking you questions and you're trying to think about and talk about Jesus to people. And the first thing I wanted to share with you is the one that uh, I use the most, and that is this. Can I pray for you? I've, I've used this scores of times over the years. I've never had anyone say to me, no, thank you. They've always said yes and been very thankful. And in fact, somebody was somebody at church was telling me the other day They've run into an old friend just recently and this old friend sent them a text message afterwards knowing they were a Christian and said, please pray for me. It's a, it's a great way in to witness to people about Jesus. The next thing is that often people will say things about the Bible. They will, uh, they will say the Bible says this or Jesus says that. And I always, always ask them gently, have, have you read the Bible? And if they say no, then I say, well, you know, I can get you a copy of it. You can read it for yourself and make up your own mind. Ask any questions you like. The next one I would say is if people come to you with a question, and this is, you know, not unusual, they've got a curly question, you don't know the answer, say, not sure, but I'll find out for you. I'll, I'll go and get an answer. The other thing you can say to them is, well, come and I ask questions at church. I mean, this is a thing that Paul didn't have at the time. He didn't have a group of wise Christians who could get around that person and help them out. But of course, there are situations where people ask you difficult questions about suffering, you know, why certain things have happened in time and space and history. And I want to say to you that it's okay to say, I'm sorry, I really don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. But I still know that for instance, God loves me and he loves you and he's trying to care for us. Now, let's get back to Paul. He's at the Areopagus. He's delivered this speech. What are the responses that he gets? Well, we see that he gets two responses. The first one of those responses is, I guess you would call it a no. Uh, in verse 32, the first half, it tells us, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. That was it. They sort of dismissed it. They treated him with contempt. And I want to say to you, that's okay. Because the resurrection is a hard thing. In fact, I would go so far as to say this. Christianity lives or dies on the resurrection. And yes, uh, the pun was intended. Without the resurrection, Christianity can't exist. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14, he says, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So it's okay for people to struggle with the resurrection. People struggle with Jesus and then came to follow him later on. But of course, this is not everyone. There is another response. 
And the other response we hear about in verses 32 to 34 tells us, others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus. So this is an amazing thing. Uh, a philosopher, a member of this council, comes to believe in Jesus when his worldview is miles away from where we would think Jesus is. In the same way as the Pharisees, many of them became Christians. And we hear about a woman called Damaris as well. So this is, in, this is amazing stuff. In fact, as I, as I did a bit of a look around on, on the web, I, I typed in, you know, the oldest church in Athens. And it gave me a picture of this church. Um, it was built in uh, 1050 AD. And it's called the church, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, the Church of Panangia Kapanakiaria. It's in Athens. Um, the interesting thing about this church is, well, I'm not sure about this building in particular, but the church building replaced a pagan temple. And this is apparently a common thing in, uh, in Greece. As churches were built, they were built on the site of pagan temples. So we might have thought that Paul's words, uh, as he spoke to the Areopagus that day, were, were short of power. But in fact, the thing that we see here is that Greece, as a country, um, turned to Jesus. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And they did. So, follow us as we continue to go through the book of Acts and see the amazing things that God has done. Let's pray. Thanks God for the amazing things that Paul did there at the Areopagus, for his words. Lord, give us the right words to speak to our friends. Amen.